Hi, everybody. Welcome to another of the DC Master Gardener Summer 2021 Continuing Education Series. This is episode eight, Pruning with a Purpose with Jake Hendy. Jake, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Patricia. And I will uh, see if I can share my side of the screen and then we will just uh, run away with it. All right, so Patricia, are you able to see and hear, uh, see my screen and, and hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. All right. Uh, well, uh, um, welcome everyone and, and thank you, uh, Patricia, for, for having me. Um, uh, my name is Jake Hendy. I'm the arborist with Smithsonian Gardens. Uh, and as you, as you can see here, the talk today is Prune with a Purpose, an Interactive Discussion. So as the title implies, uh, it's our goal today to get you, the audience, interactively involved with the content and sharing your, your tree and shrub pruning challenges in the second half of the hour. Uh, I want to thank uh, several of you for already uh, uh, reaching out with your, your tree and shrub pruning conundrums. Uh, so uh, um, I've, I've included some of those photos at the end, and I hope to uh, spark a, a little bit of discussion um, after we get through this uh, first bit of content. Uh, here at the beginning of the talk. So um, this talk is based upon a lecture that I put together last fall uh, for our Smithsonian Gardens Let's Talk Gardens series. And, and just an advertising plug, I, I believe that will begin uh, here in a couple weeks, again on September 9th, if you're looking for um, uh, additional gardening webinar content. Uh, so as arborist at Smithsonian Gardens, one of the fun parts of my job is, is managing one of the Smithsonian's official collections, the trees. So I'd like to first introduce you to, uh, to this resource, si.gardenexplorer.org, uh, to explore our collection. It includes a wealth of tree photos uh, you'll see throughout the presenta presentation today, and the picture trees are just a few highlights uh, from our collection. Um, so the objectives today, um, this is not a basic pruning how-to. Um, there are a lot of great resources already out there for that. Um, but if you're a beginner, I think it's worth sticking with us. I think you'll still benefit from a lot of the content and, and learn a lot of things along the way. So uh, the first half of the hour, I've got a lot of content to review ideas about how to help your how to help yourself think more like a professional arborist. Um, so working through a pruning thought process, um, specifically making sure we have a clearly defined purpose for pruning uh, and then sharing a few ideas that I think are kind of my, my secrets to success when I'm out pruning. Uh, hopefully that first half of the hour will prime you all to share your challenges uh, at the ends. So we'll, we'll open up the chat box and, and uh, the microphones a little bit. We've got some examples that people have shared with us uh, to hopefully apply our, our new way of, of thinking. So uh, uh, we'll have a little bit of fun with that at the end. Um, I definitely want you to be a better tree and shrub pruner, um, but pruning can also get dangerous. So when you add a little bit of height, start using chainsaws, sharp tools, those sorts of things. Um, so most importantly, um, uh, please be safe when, when doing any pruning. Um, if in doubt, if there's height or tools that, that you're not trained and comfortable with, please hire a professional. Um, there are plenty of examples about there of pruning and, and tree work in general. Um, gone wrong. Please, please don't be one of them. That said, I think you'll get a much better product from a professional uh, tree care company if you're an informed consumer, um, aware and conversant on pruning techniques and, and theory. Uh, so again, a quick outline of the ground that I hope to cover today. I've got a lot of content here in the first half of the hour, uh, and then and then the second half is all about uh, moving the spotlight to to you all. So. Um, First, we'll start with a little bit of a spoiler alert, the main points that I want you to take home. Uh, second, I'll review a thought process that will hopefully make you a better pruner, make you think a little bit more like an arborist. Um, third, I'll reinforce that with, again, what I think of as sort of my secrets to success in thinking about uh, tree and shrub pruning. Uh, and then fourth, I'll circle back to those take home points. Uh, mostly I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, trees today. Um, but as I saw with some of the examples that came my way, a lot of this applies to shrub and small woody plant pruning. So we'll, we'll dig, uh, looks like into the sort of those small woody issues here in the, in the last half of the hour. So um, again, we'll turn, turn the spotlight to you here in the, the second half of the hour and, and uh, we'll, we'll 
definitely appreciate your participation in discussing uh, tree and shrub pruning issues. Um, so part one, uh, first we'll, we'll review the take home points. Uh, here are the spoiler alerts for the day. So take home point number one, uh, uh, as the title of the talk would imply, uh, we need to have a clearly defined purpose when we're pruning a tree or shrub. So uh, absent that, we're just cutting branches and, and every branch we cut is injury to the tree or shrub that, that we're pruning. So um, there are certainly consequences to cutting branches haphazardly um, as this photo of a large hollow created by, by pruning injury uh, illustrates. So without a clearly defined purpose, pruning is just, just haphazardly inflicting injuries to the tree. Take home point number two, Basic uh, understanding basic tree shrub physiology is critical to good pruning, um, and it can help answer several important questions. Um, first, decay. If I prune, will the tree decay? Uh, second, health. If I prune, will the tree be healthier, or will, will it even survive? Um, and then growth response. If I prune, what crazy growth response will, will plant hormone signals uh, foreseeably cause, uh, such as this sort of apple tree growing uh, out of control after a heavy pruning. And then my final third take home point is pr pruning is a long-term strategy. Um, we need to think of pruning as proactively building the trees we want rather than a reactive overnight fix to a situation that's likely been developing for years. Um, here's a great example of two trees that are about 10 years apart in age. On the older tree back here, um, let's say we have a large low branch, this branch here on the back uh, right side of the tree that we, that we don't love, um, that we want to remove. Um, but there's really no good way to remove it without creating a huge wound and a huge gap on, on the entire side of the tree. If we see that issue coming 10 years earlier, we can usually just remove that, that small branch that's starting to become a problem um, uh, before it becomes a problem. So again, think of pruning more as a long-term strategy rather than a single event to to fix things immediately. Um, uh, so I'll move to part two here, and this is, uh, we'll break pruning trees and shrubs into an eight step process that again, I propose you should take, uh, uh, should take you through most of the considerations that a practicing arborist is going to work through um, before each tree they prune. Um, this is not something you'll read in a textbook. It's sort of my take on what someone with a little bit of awareness of plants and a little bit of common sense uh, um, might, might help uh, you think more like an arborist. So uh, first, step one, know your tree. Um, step two, pause. Um, really, my emphasis uh, here is taking our time, thinking through what we're doing uh, before we do it. Um, step three, uh, assess our tree's health. Step four, assess the site and how happy the tree is in that site. Uh, again, pause one more time. Take your time before you start cutting branches, um, especially if you're more of a be beginner. Just enjoy nature a little bit. Um, step six, define your purpose. What is it that you're trying to accomplish with cutting branches? Um, uh, and this is really the, the meat of the content today is, is as again, as the title highlights, is, is making sure we have a purpose before we start cutting branches. Um, step seven, plan for the future. You know, what's your vision of the tree uh, long term? What branches are you going to cut today? What branches are you going to save for next year? And then how are you going to set yourself up to cut those branches next year? Uh, and then finally, uh, after, after eight steps, you're, you're free to, to prune, prune away. So step one, know your tree. Um, identify your tree, um, or at least get close. Uh, use the wealth of resources out there from, from our own Garden Explorer app at, at Smithsonian Gardens to just social media um, professionals in the field. There are a lot of resources to identify what your tree is uh, and then write it down. Um, and then that's really important because we need to be able to do enough research to answer a couple questions. Where is your tree happiest in terms of soils, moisture, sun, shade? Um, and then how does it grow? Is it a large tree? Is it a small tree? Um, is it a fast growing tree, a slower growing tree? Is it known to be durable wood? Um, those sorts of questions. So get familiar, but, but don't stress over every last detail. Step two, 
pause, put the pruners down. Again, in my experience, it's a natural instinct to just start cutting branches before we even thought about how or why we're cutting those branches. So take some time at the tree, enjoy the weather, again, especially if you're more of a beginner. Step three, assess your tree's health. Uh, there's a common misconception that pruning fixes tree and shrub health. Um, in most cases, that's completely false. Um, there are a few exceptions. Um, the facts are, again, a healthy tree will tolerate pruning and respond well. Uh, an unhealthy tree is not going to become healthier by cutting off branches and leaves, usually. Um, use common sense when assessing tree health. If the tree is dense, lush, dark green leaves, if it's growing quickly, it's probably doing pretty well. Um, once you start seeing yellowing, dieback, thinning of the canopy, slow growth, that's the time to slow down and consider whether it has health issues that need to be addressed first. Uh, step four, assess the site. Um, is the tree happy in its site? So here's a, a fun example of a couple silver bell trees that are planted uh, a few feet away from each other uh, on the same day. On the left here, a quick site assessment would tell you this tree is planted in a somewhat compacted soil. Uh, you might also happen to know that this was previously affected by heavy construction traffic. Um, and then common sense would tell you this thin canopy uh, showing some signs of uh, tree health stress. On the right, you'd quickly find uh, with the site assessment, the soil underneath is, the tree is a fluffy, heavily amended, highly organic soil that mimics where this tree grows in nature. Moist, well-drained, well aerated, probably slightly acidic. Um, and then the dense canopy here would certainly imply that it's happy in its site. This yellow color is just because this photo was taken uh, uh, in the fall. It's a really, really, really healthy tree. And of course that impacts how we prune. Uh, we have a lot more flexibility with this tree on the right that's happy in its site than, than the tree over here. You know, if we do anything more than cut off dead branches, this tree is gonna, gonna die. Step five, again, the emphasis on stepping back, pausing and understanding what's going on with the tree before cutting branches, before starting to inflict injuries on the tree. Uh, in the case of the silver bells, we worked on uh, loosening up the soil with this air excavation tool, and then we incorporated soil amendments to uh, fix those tree health issues before really thinking much about pruning. Uh, many tree health issues, many tree and shrub health issues can be attributed to our planting and mulching practices. Um, here's one talk that I put together on, on these issues uh, um, earlier, earlier this year. That's available on our website uh, and on YouTube and, and explains really a great deal of the tree, tree and shrub health issues that we encounter on the landscape. Step six, define a purpose or objectives for uh, doing your pruning. So again, this is really the main point of the presentation today. Have a reason for cutting branches. Um, there's, there's no one way to prune. Uh, it really depends on why you own the tree where it is and what you wanna get out of it. So uh, here are a few examples. We have this uh, flowering mature saucer magnolia in our Haupt garden. Uh, our objective with this tree is just to keep it looking nice, um, uh, not much else. Uh, along the same lines, uh, this American holly at our, in our uh, naturalistic landscape at the American Indian Museum, we just want it to look natural, so not much pruning needed. Um, on the other hand, this large mature oak tree over a playground, um, our objective there is to keep the, the uh, people beneath it, the, the kids playing below safe. So we wanna make sure that we're, we're managing for hazards and, and doing as much as we can to keep, keep this tree structurally in good condition. This large elm tree with Dutch elm disease, well, we wanna prune out the disease so we can save the tree. Uh, and then finally a crab apple hedge over here at our, our Hirschhorn Museum. Uh, we just want to maintain its topiary hedge form as, as a designed uh, uh, landscape element. So all very different objectives for different trees um, uh, really defines how we prune those trees. So there are a huge number of pruning objectives you can choose, uh, purposes for cutting branches. Um, uh, you can choose one or more of those to maintain your tree, depending upon what you want from that tree and get where it's at. Uh, so here's a long list from our tree care industry standard. 
Um, not all are appropriate for every tree. So proceed conscientiously, do your research, make sure it's compatible with, with your tree uh, on the site that you're working on. So um, moving on to step seven, plan for the future. So pruning is a process, not an event. Um, here's a tree that we completed a little bit of light structural pruning on uh, uh, several times over the past few years. Uh, you can see most of the low branches on the tree are just temporary branches that we don't want on the tree when it's mature. Um, because these buses driving down Independence Avenue uh, will just crash into those branches until they uh, get torn off the tree. So we planned for the future here by just keeping these temporary branches low on the tree, relatively small compared to the main stem and compared to these, these taller branches um, by just reducing their tips back each time we pruned it so we can easily remove these branches with a small non-invasive pruning cut once this pruning canopy develops above um, over the next uh, uh, few years. And then finally, um, after thoroughly thinking it through, we arrive at finally picking up the pruners and actually cutting branches. So, so again, I'm not gonna go into pruning basics today, but a few highlights again, make sure you're safe, call in a professional if, if it's, uh, uh, if in doubt, make good clean cuts. Um, respect the branch collar or the swelling at the, the base of the, the branch by making a proper pruning cut, um, and then use the right tools that are sharp and well-maintained. And I highlighted here a favorite pruning tool of mine, uh, the pole pruner. Uh, you can really do a lot of good in, in your tree's first 10 to 15 years uh, without leaving the ground. Or if you're managing a small tree or shrub, this, this uh, pole pruner will, will reach just about any part of that at, at any time. Part three, review the keys to successful pruning. So again, these are kind of my, um, my secrets to a success. You won't find these again in a textbook, but they're things that you know, I was thinking as far as what do I wanna share with people? This is my list of about four things that I think are really important to uh, your success in pruning. Um, so again, following up on that basic thought process, here are a few sort of highlights that, that I really wanna zero in on. Um, first, Pay attention to the buds. So when, when learning to prune, many of us are taught to look for dead, broken, crossing branches. Uh, uh, and that's not necessarily bad, but we don't see the bigger picture. Um, so I'll advocate a lot more for paying attention to the buds on the tree, which we'll talk about here in a second, um, and, and thinking about how trees will respond uh, uh, to our pruning cuts. Second, prune for structure. As I mentioned earlier, pruning does relatively little to improve tree and shrub health most of the time. So uh, if we're going for uh, uh, tree health, thinking dense, green growth, uh, good, good annual branch extension, things like that that show the tree is really functioning well, um, pruning isn't going to do a lot to achieve that for us. But what it does achieve is it changes the structure of the tree. So I want you to think of pruning as building the tree we want structurally. Keep cuts small and minimize minimize leaf area removal. So oftentimes we, when we prune, we, we mistake that big flush of growth afterward as a good sign. Um, the reality is, is oftentimes that's a stress or confusion response uh, uh, as a result of plant hormone signals. Um, so we want to be thinking about how little we can remove but achieve our short-term and long-term goals. Um, and then finally, look to the future as we've already talked about uh, and piggybacking off this last point, the best way to minimize how much we remove from the tree is frequent low dose pruning. So looking into the future and envisioning the tree we want to build, uh, that allows us to uh, remove a small branch today, potentially avoid a stressful and damaging removal of a larger branch later on. So uh, we'll break, into, break down each of these one by one, uh, again, before getting that second half of the presentation. So Starting with paying attention to the buds. Uh, what is a bud? Uh, a bud's a structure that has the potential to, to develop into a new flower, a uh, new leaf, uh, and or a new branch. Um, so that means all new growth that you see on your trees and shrubs comes from a bud somewhere. So no bud, no growth. On this flowering cherry tree, all the right here, these nodes that you see coming off the branch, those are all buds that are either going to develop into flowers or leaves and and stems. Um, here's a good example of a couple buds where you find a lot of buds on trees and that's right where the, where the leaf attaches to the tree. Oftentimes you'll find buds uh, right at that point. Um, conifers can be a little bit more confusing. 
Um, here's a juniper tree. Uh, you'll find the buds on this almost imperceptibly small here, out here at the tips of, of each of these uh, um, uh, scales on the juniper. Um, and then of course, we're, we're all probably familiar with the candles on, on the tip of the pine tree branch. Um, that's where you'll find the buds on uh, um, pines and many other conifers. So why are buds important? Well, again, if there's no bud, there's no growth. So if you cut off all the buds, you kill that branch or you, you may even kill the entire tree. So um, you'll see buds in three different places that behave very differently. Um, first, you'll see terminal buds out here at the tips of each uh, uh, growing branch. So these buds generally expand outward to provide height and width growth. Uh, lateral buds, most often found where the leaf is attached to the branch. These, um, so here, 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 and here. Um, these mostly stay dormant uh, unless they get a signal such as light or again plant hormonal cues um, to expand uh, into uh, growth. So an especially common mistake that you see with pines and, and some other conifers is to cut the growing buds off uh, uh, to where you would expect uh, to find another bud here where the needle attaches to the tree. But if you look at this photo, um, there are no buds here where the uh, needles attach to the tree as you might expect to find. Um, so again, with, with a lot of conifers, people will actually kill branches or whole trees by, by removing all the buds on accident by shearing, shearing the tree or, or just cutting a branch back really, really hard. Uh, and then finally, the third type of bud, and these can be really handy or really annoying, uh, one of the two uh, or both, um, trees will often hide buds in spots that you don't expect, like uh, under thick bark on the lower stems, even at the base of the tree. Uh, again, these are usually dormant uh, and they'll pop up and surprise you like we pruned a couple branches off this lower stem of an elm tree and all these little water sprouts that came off this tree are the result of latent buds that were buried in the bark. So in this case, they were kind of annoying, but they can also be really helpful in some other cases. And so now that we know the type of buds, we can talk about plant hormone pathways. And I'll, I'll limit this to a slide or two, but, I'll, but this is really, really important. So if you're going to pay attention to a slide, um, uh, this is the one. So uh, plant growth is, uh, woody plant growth is, is a battle primarily between two plant hormones, auxins uh, and cytokinins. Um, so auxins are produced up here in the terminal buds. Um, they suppress canopy growth. They suppress growth of new leaves. They uh, stimulate root growth and they counteract the effects of cytokinins. Cytokinins are produced down here uh, in the roots uh, and are pushed, uh, they suppress root growth. And as they come up the tree, they stimulate canopy growth and counteract the effects of auxins. Um, so because auxin is produced up here in the terminal buds, um, these tips, it suppresses the growth of all the lateral buds on the branch. So here, 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 here and here are not growing because those auxins um, are suppressing the growth. But if we were to remove, say, both of these tips, both of these terminal buds out here, that removes our source of auxin that's suppressing the growth and the remainder of the, of the branch. And all those cytokinins coming up from the roots will then press this into growth, this into growth, this into growth, this into growth, this into growth uh, and this into growth. So um, if we don't remove these tips out here at the ends, um, that will, again, continue to produce auxin, suppress the effect of cytokines, and we'll have much more uh, controlled growth uh, uh, in the branch that we're pruning. Uh, so again, auxins produced up here in the tip, um, discourage, uh, uh, counteract the effects of the cytokines down from below, uh, and discourage these buds from, from bursting into growth. Uh, on the other hand, those cytokines that are coming up from, from the base, um, if there's no auxin to counteract them, they will encourage these buds to, to grow. Um, so here's an example from my backyard where I, you can see I cut off the tip of this uh, uh, little single stem uh, uh, oak tree uh, and the two lateral buds just below, as soon as that tip was cut, these just grew up. And again, that's because I removed the source of auxin here at the tip of the branch, then cytokinins pushed out and created new growth. Uh, maybe where I wanted it, maybe where I didn't want it. So uh, uh, again, there are major pruning implications and, and knowing what the tree is going to do 
plant hormone wise when we prune uh, is really going to uh, uh, help us understand what we're doing and, and prune the right branches in the right way. So a uh, couple pruning examples, um, the nursery industry, uh, how it uses auxins and cytokines to produce trees that you and I want to buy. Um, so most trees start from seeds or cuttings, of relatively unbranched trees, so just a single stem known as a whip. So a scraggly, scraggly little single stem tree. Um, if we cut off the terminal bud of the nursery, kind of like I did in the oak tree in the last slide, um, that removes that source of oxygen production here at the top uh, of this tree and then allows those cytokinins that are produced in the roots to push out some lateral branches on this single stem tree until here in the third photo, it becomes, it's got some, some lateral branches on it. It's starting to look like a tree. Eventually, these lateral branches here uh, develop terminal buds of their own that produce oxen um, that discourages further branching. Uh, so that's where you see in photo four, nurseries will again prune each one of those little tips um, to encourage the development of a dense canopy uh, on the tree. Again, removing the oxen source, all those cytokines come up and push new branches out of those, uh, those dormant buds. Uh, and then finally in photo five, it's not the best photo, but you can see us installing a tree with a nice thick, dense uh, canopy because it's been pruned like this over several years in the nursery. This works really well in the nursery to create a nice looking uh, tree that people want to buy, but it isn't necessarily how we want to manage most of the trees uh, on our landscape. It's simply an example. Uh, a couple other examples, hedging and topiary. Uh, again, when we pull out the hedge shears and we clip off a lot of the branch tips, uh, uh, we remove all those terminal buds, we remove all those sources of oxygen production. Uh, so those cytokines push out growth from new places and thicken up the hedge. Um, directional pruning is another good example. Uh, and that's most recognizable as the ugly pruning that your utility company uses to keep the trees out of the power lines. Um, it can be a super useful tool um, for your own trees and it that uh, um, relies on identifying where the buds are and how they're going to respond um, in a way that the person pruning that tree can direct that growth um, to where they want it, such as away from the power line or away from over the top of your house. Those sorts of things is, is what we're looking at with, with directional pruning. So uh, one, one nice tool to be able to use when doing directional pruning, say maybe it's just away from your front sidewalk or something like that, is if you have a long branch that's reaching in a direction you don't like, you can just prune it back to a smaller lateral branch, it's called reduction cut. Um, because that little branch still has a terminal bud that produces auxins out here, um, that will discourage branching below that on the branch and you will have just redirected this branch from re reaching out in the direction you don't want it to, just to a shorter branch that's pointing right uh, in this case. Pruning is about building a tree architecture that we want and need uh, for whatever purpose it is that we have identified. Um, it's usually not about tree health. Um, so as you can see uh, with this tree that's been chopped to bits, um, pruning may cause a vigorous growth response as a result of those short-term plant hormonal cues. Again, all the oxygen sources have been removed up here. So this tree just shoots out growth everywhere, makes a total mess. Um, but that growth response is not necessarily indicative of positive long-term carbohydrate balance uh, for the tree. So whenever I see a tree prune like this, my question is what's, what's the long-term vision for the tree architecture and structure um, of that tree? Uh, here's an example of pruning for structure. Um, it's my favorite type of pruning, structural pruning. Um, our biggest loss of urban trees is not diseases, it's not insect pests or some other factor out of our control. Um, it's because our trees develop weaknesses that fail during storms, high winds, or maybe we just remove the tree because uh, uh, we're concerned about um, structural issues that it may have. Um, decades of research and practice have taught us exactly the characteristics of trees that remain strong uh, and long lived on the landscape uh, versus those trees that, that uh, uh, get blown down by high winds or need to be removed for safety reasons. Uh, so again, we know exactly those characteristics and it usually is uh, some combination of a single main stem, well-spaced, well-attached, appropriately sized secondary branches, uh, a large live crown ratio. So, so a lot of, most of the height of the tree is, is a live crown uh, and then a balanced crown. So um, what's the obvious solution? 
um, just prune our trees to have those characteristics. Um, and there are a number of really great pruning techniques out there uh, in the structural pruning literature. Uh, to my opinion, we should be doing it for the vast majority of our trees. Uh, and at the Smithsonian, as much as possible, we invest in building strong trees from the start rather than dealing with those sort of expensive and tricky problems later uh, in the tree's life. Uh, next, we want to keep cuts uh, small and, and minimize the amount of foliage that we remove. So as anyone who has ever owned a wooden deck or a wooden fence can attest, wood decays. So this is particularly true for the interior heartwood on a tree or shrub. Uh, so this part here, uh, and less so for the live cells and the sapwood uh, uh, on the outer part of the tree. So by minimizing the size of your cuts, you minimize the chance of decay resulting in, in things like this, hollow trees, see-through trees, um, you know, this tiny little bit of wood holding up the, this entire decayed tree or, or just trees, trees falling over. So the more you're able to look into the future to avoid larger cuts in the future, the better pruner you will become. And of course, the second part of this is percent foliage removed. We all learned in elementary school biology that tree leaves convert solar energy, water, carbon dioxide into sugars from plant growth. The more foliage and leaf area a tree has, the more sugar it is going to be able to produce. The more sugar the tree is able to produce, the more vigorous and resilient it is going to be. Um, so we want to remove as little foliage as possible to accomplish our goals. Um, but we also want to acknowledge that a healthy tree has plenty of reser reserves when we need to remove more than, than usual uh, during pruning. Uh, and then finally, kind of the last uh, uh, key to successful pruning, uh, again, as we've talked about several times in this presentation already, is to be able to look to the future. So as I've alluded to in earlier slides, uh, pruning with foresight is one of the best skills to be able to minimize shocks to the tree. Um, so here's the story of two, two Patriot elms, so again, planted on the same day. Uh, the tree on the left was pruned pretty well for our objectives uh, uh, in the nursery. Um, whereas this tree at the right uh, um, uh, was, was not really pruned that much in the nursery, so it required a lot more corrective work for the objectives that we were pruning for. Um, so despite pruning this tree every year for about the uh, two to three years before we took this photo, it's really got a pretty natural form to it. Uh, whereas because the, this tree wasn't pruned with as much foresight, um, you can see these big choppy pruning cuts were necessary to kind of whip, whip this tree back into shape. If we, if we had pruned this tree uh, or if the nursery had pruned this tree with, with sort of looking into the future, um, uh, it would have been a lot easier on the tree long term. But we certainly uh, uh, made the determination that it was an acceptable cost to bear, uh, make some heavy cuts on this tree so it would be better off later on. So as we've discussed, again, it's best for our trees and shrubs if we minimize how much we prune from the tree in terms of the size of the branches and the amount of leaf area that we remove from it. Um, it's also worth recognizing that sometimes a large cut today is better than a larger cut tomorrow. So to avoid that tough decision, um, start from day zero with a clear vision of the tree um, that you're hoping to build and achieve with, again, proactive, frequent light doses of pruning. And here's an example where uh, we, we had this low branched elm tree that we kind of got away from us. We took a big chunk, uh, a couple lower branches off of it. Uh, again, because a big cut today is better than a, than a bigger cut tomorrow. And, and we really wanted to get this, uh, this can't be lifted up and, and out of the way before that branch got, got any bigger. Uh, so I will conclude sort of the lecture front half of this uh, um, uh, webinar by just reviewing those take home points. Uh, again, starting with without a clearly defined purpose, why are we cutting branches? Uh, pruning, again, is just uh, inflicting injuries to the tree. Um, so we need to make sure we know why we're cutting those branches. Um, second, understanding basic tree and shrub physiology is critical to good pruning. And, and this isn't complicated stuff, but just the if I make a big cut to a tree, it's, it's more likely to decay. Uh, if I cut a bunch of foliage out of the tree, if I take all the leaves off the tree, it's probably going to stress it out a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, everything we're discussing about the, the plant hormone signals is, is oftentimes we can understand exactly how a tree is going to respond. 
Uh, and then for third, finally, pruning should be a long-term strategy, not a single uh, event. So the more that we can uh, proactively uh, define the vision of what the tree we want to build uh, and then achieve that with again, frequent light doses of pruning that don't stress the tree, uh, the better off that, that tree or, or shrub is going to become long-term. So with that, I am out of lecture content. Uh, and again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, and I, and I know the, uh, the description for the talk uh, uh, highlighted as well, uh, is I wanted to spend the, the second half of the presentation today really hearing from you all, uh, maybe getting a little bit of discussion going, though we'll have to be careful with as many people we have in here. Um, and uh, uh, so I will move to the first case study. Uh, and Catherine was uh, kind enough to share um, several photos of some hydrangeas um, uh, that she had some questions about pruning. Um, and is it possible that Catherine is on the call and able to unmute? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, your hydrangeas and, and what your, your pruning question is. Uh, I've, I've highlighted sort of what we have in the email, um, but uh, just thought it might be helpful for the group to hear from you and then we'll kind of work through the pruning process on it. Definitely. So um, I um, planted the hydrangeas probably around 10 years ago when after we moved into the house and had a lot of um, yard work done. We had some structural trees we had to take down um, and so that was all part of the new planting was putting in the um, auto Lucan laurels across the back, as well as the, um, the hydrangeas. They were beautiful for about eight years. We did do a construction project, not in the front of the house, but they did have to put up those, you know, like black barrier things. Um, and since we've been back since 2019, they just never got you know gotten flowers anymore they kind of have like rusty looking spots on them um they shoot up growth i have like pruned off any like dead branches and whatnot over you know over the past two years but i have several of them and so i wasn't sure if maybe there's air circulation um it doesn't it gets sun um, but there are a couple of street trees um you know that do block some of the sun um, so I wasn't sure if maybe they've just lived out their usefulness or if maybe some, you know, pruning a hard pruning or something can maybe like bring it back. Mm -hmm. And, and the, I guess the one question I had before we work through sort of the, these steps uh, of, of thinking about how to prune these um, is whether they were pruned, uh, um, have they been pruned recently or they've mostly just been let go? Um, I mean, they've kind of, for the most part, been let go because I, you know, I know, I think they do bloom, like they've always had like new growth on mm -hmm. them, um, even like in the fall and early winter, like it will have like little bud growth. So I've never wanted to like cut them back too much just because I, you know, some plants grow on new wood, some grow on old. And so in my research, I would just trim the ones that I knew needed trimming or were maybe like damaged in the snow or something and not like been super proactive and like really did any real trimming on them. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, th thank you for sharing. Yeah, that, um, this is this is great. So just kind of working through the uh, the steps of, of uh, you know, how to think about pruning these. So, um, you know, first knowing your, your tree or your plant, uh, and I, I'll be the first to admit, I haven't pruned a lot of high ranges. So, so I'm kind of uh, guessing my way through this with you and, and uh, um, definitely will love any, any feedback that, that others may be able to, uh, to offer. Um, you know, but the first thing I'm thinking about is, is again sort of knowing knowing the plant. So we know that it that it likes part shade, it likes it moist, um, um, but definitely well drained. So it's not going to want flooded soils. Um, as you mentioned, it blooms on on old wood, um, but but not on really old stems. So if if these are the same stems that were planted, uh, uh, you know, eight eight years ago, then then maybe it's time for. Um, um, uh, to try to get some some of the younger, uh, try to spur some younger stems and, and get some uh, um, some new growth in, in on these plants. 
Um, and then they bloom best, when, uh, I know you mentioned blooms as an issue, so they bloom best when the light is right. So if it's too shady, um, they, they may not bloom. Uh, and then of course, if they're getting scorched by full sun all the time, they may, may be a little bit unhappy and, and not blooming all the time. So, um, so again, step two, not really time to prune, prune yet, but uh, you've done, done the research on the plants. Um, step three, assess the tree or, or shrub's health. So um, uh, in this case, uh, you know, they, they don't look, um, you know, looking at the leaves and, and the growth and everything, they, they certainly look to be putting out growth and, and everything, but, but they, you know, may not be the happiest uh, uh, plant in the world. So we definitely uh, maybe don't want to uh, um, uh, be pruning them really heavy. Um, step four, assess the site. And I think that gets into a lot of the things I mentioned earlier about probably a lot of the questions that we don't have answers to in a, in a short uh, uh, presentation here uh, is, you know, are they getting the right light for the plant? Um, are they getting enough moisture, but not get it, getting saturated soils? Are they happy in their site? And again, that's the sort of thing. It sounds like you've done, done a lot of that research and, and uh, um, they've probably got, got a Sounds like maybe a good enough site, but we're not sure something might be wrong with the soils or something like that. Um, so again, you know, step five, put the pruners down. Don't, you know, uh, spend some time um, thinking about uh, uh, what we want to do with these. Um, step six, define your purpose. So Catherine, if, if you're still on there, I guess, what would you say the purpose is for, for these uh, um, uh, woody shrubs? What, what are you trying to accomplish by, by having these here? And I've got a couple of guesses, but I thought I'd ask you first. Oh, of course. So basically we do um, a lot of garden walks because, um, I don't know, that's just what my husband and I and children like to do. And so I hear criticism from my family early and often that how can a master gardener have such ugly hydrangeas in the front yard where everyone walks by and sees them? So I kind of am feeling like maybe if they're not you know, if they've outlived their usefulness. I mean, I've never met a plant that I don't like. I mean, if I hear people giving away plants, I'll go get them just because I don't want them to throw them away. But at some point, I just wonder if like maybe they are just not fixable. Yeah, yeah. And so so what I'm hearing is basically you're looking for, a, you know, just a basically a beautiful plant that's, that's uh, you know, full of green, healthy foliage. And, and as uh, um, uh, I think you mentioned in, in in your email earlier today, you want to get lots of blooms out of these uh, these plants, right? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, and so so that's where I think getting getting us to step seven here is is uh, we've got uh, you know just doing a little bit of, of research on and, and we didn't get a chance to talk about shrub pruning too much today, um, but doing a little bit of research on on shrub pruning, um, you know, it sounds like there's there's a few options here. Cer certainly, we um, we could replace these with something that maybe likes the conditions better. Um, but as far as things to try for uh, for pruning, um, you know, the one thing it it sounds like might be going wrong on on or I guess I'll just kind of take a pause and talk about shrub pruning a little bit, which we didn't get get all that much of a chance um, to do today. Is there's many sort of multi-stem um, shrubs such as hydrangeas that you know once that um, they're going to bloom on old wood, but once that old wood gets gets too old, too crowded, they may sort of uh, decline in their bloom. So one thing you can do to rejuvenate a lot of uh, older shrubs is either thin those those canes, thin those stems, um, which as we kind of talked about earlier in the presentation, will remove some of those oxen sources, open up some light, and allow for new stems to come in, which which may bloom uh, better. Or one really just sort of last case uh, um, uh, scenario would be uh, if you've got a really healthy shrub, but it's just not performing the way you want to, you can just mow it down to about six inches and uh, and then manage uh, uh, manage the stems that regrow. Uh, of course, they won't re they won't bloom that first year. Um, but um, as you look toward the future, you'll get some blooms that that second year. Um, uh, and then um, if you plan to say a thin a third of the those stems out every year, um, then you'll continue to spur new growth that fills in uh, behind it. So. A couple sort of shrub pruning options um, that involve sort of looking to multi multi year plans. Um, but of course, again, as we talked about through the presentation, is if the plant isn't right, if the site's not right, it, it's probably not going to uh, to respond well. So uh, a, a few options, hopefully working through that process, uh, and then step eight pruning. So so if again it were me and and I thought the site conditions matched what the research told me, I'd probably start by removing a few thinning out about a third of those stems. 
uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, seeing if I could spur a few new stems that will, will bloom better and, and look healthier over time. It'll probably come in in year two and year three and see if I can, again, remove some of those older stems to uh, uh, spur those cytokinins in the roots to, to drive up new growth and, and get some flowers going. So, so hopefully that gives you a few few options or at least maybe a new new way to think about this. And um, I will, uh, I think I, we uh, spent quite a bit of time on this. So I will move on to the next case study. Uh, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll have time here to cover a couple more. So I'm just covering these in the orders they were Order they were received today, but uh, we received this awesome photo uh, of Helen's worst case scenario. Helen, are you are you on it all and able to, to share anything further? I am on, um, and I almost think it's starting at step uh, six might be <laughs> might be the way to go. Um, I uh, uh, inherited these bushes when I bought my house a few years ago. Um, they were clearly um, planted for the sole purpose of creating privacy between the two houses. Um, you can see that what happened is that the house next door got torn down and um, uh, it, it, there's a construction project going on. And when, when the uh, a bulldozer went through early on, they did damage both of these two plants, the one on the left being a euonymus of some sort and the one on the right being a skip laurel. Um, they they don't get because they're between the two houses and to the left would be south. Um, they get some sun, but not a lot. So in terms of the location, the euonymus theoretically would be fine, but you can see how thick the stems are. And then mm -hmm. there are more euonymus to the left and it was creating an adequate uh, barrier. And then last year they kind of went crazy and just grew like crazy. So I had somebody cut the tops off thinking, let's get some sun in there. And that didn't go well. So then I took to the various implements I had at my disposal and started hacking away at them after the bulldozer had ripped the sides off. So um, it, it, oh, down to the left, I did plant, I had planted um, two Arbovidae, um, thinking that maybe I could get those going um, and remove, slowly remove the euonymus. But I, it, it, just like Catherine said, I, I hate to, to get rid of a plant. I hate to give up on a plant unless I absolutely must. And I realize that skip laurel looks as though it's getting pretty close to that point. I, I think these are, these are a great example um, as well. Um, you know, I will uh, kind of skip with you down down these steps pretty quickly. But both these are pretty uh, pretty adaptable trees or pretty adaptable shrubs that uh, uh, look look like they uh, they took a lot of damage, um, but uh, they they do appear to uh, 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 you know have uh, certainly they're they're growing back to some extent. Uh, one thing I wanted to highlight though is assessing the tree's health. You know, one thing we see with construction, I'm kind of maybe seeing this with the uh, with the laurel on the right, um, is that if a tree is is not healthy, um, uh, then we got to be careful about pruning it. So uh, oftentimes with construction, when soils get damaged or light gets really heavily altered, um, the tree is in a state of shock and may take several years to recover. So. Uh, I think this gets into a lot of the points earlier about, you know, for this tree, it's uh, for the laurel on the right, it's probably a wait and see uh, till this tree is healthy before we really try to manipulate its its growth pattern. Um, the tree on the left looks like, or the, the euonymus looks plenty healthy. It's just a question of, as you mentioned, what do we do with it? So, uh, uh, Helen, what's what's your goal here? What what do we want out of these plants? What do, what do we want these plants to provide to you as a person who uses this space? Um, Two things. First of all, I'm old. And so I'm impatient. I, I don't have time for things to grow. So where the skip laurel is, I've already talked with American Plant Food about um, maybe getting a quite large camellia for next year. That particular spot I do look at from my kitchen. So that I it, it's it's kind of constantly irritating. On the other hand, I do want privacy. You can see over to the left a little bit of a blue from the construction there. There's a window, a huge window there in the new house. So I do 
want to maintain some degree of privacy. I mean, it, it, this is kind of a haphazard situation. To the far left, um, beyond where the uh, euonymus were planted when I bought the house, I managed to snag some Hicks U's pretty good sized ones. And I had those planted so that in my front yard, I'm looking at a Hicks U hedge, which is what I would like this to be, but I'm too old to wait. You know, I know I can't, I know I can't get um, Hicks U's that are gonna give me six to eight feet right away. Yes. So, so it's, it's privacy and it's that I don't want it to be completely embarrassing if I need to resell or I drop dead and someone needs to resell. And then where the, where the skip laurel is, I do want it to not be ugly. So, because I look at that. So, so <laughs> and, and not too tall, not too tall, Jake, because um, I don't want to shade the, you can see the fence is also ugly. It needs to be replaced. It's falling over, but um I will keep a fence there and inside there, I do need sun in there. All right, so what, what I'm hearing just, and it sounds like one of our options here as, as it was made with the previous ones is, is replacement is always something we can think about, but it's, if we're thinking about pruning these, what I'm hearing you're trying to achieve is, is beauty um, and privacy. Uh, and, and so, um, you know, a few things, yeah, obviously, these trees are, are experiencing a lot of shock, and and uh, um, you know, especially again, the laurel may not grow back in, uh, may not really start to recover, and be in a position where it can be pruned much for any for either of those objectives for a couple of years. Um, but I'm looking at this euonymus here, thinking, you know, how do we um, uh, how do we with pruning uh, achieve privacy and beauty? And so I'm going back to some of our our earlier slides, thinking of you know, if we find some of these like uh, these scraggly shoots that are shooting up for sunlight uh, and maybe we clip the tips, you know, maybe we think about shearing it a little bit, again, removing those sources of oxen out of the terminal buds uh, will force it to, uh, uh, to grow out sort of a bushier form that will fill in uh, more quickly, provide a little bit more um, uh, privacy uh, and, and uh, foliage coverage. Uh, you know, another thing we can do is with a lot of, um, with some of these, uh, you know, if we're just looking to kind of clean up the uh, the mess of foliage that's occurring everywhere, sometimes we can thin it out um, and uh, really focus on creating some some structural stems here. Um, but I think by again focusing on, uh, you know, we're trying to achieve beauty and privacy, and we've got a really healthy tree that's going to grow um, if we direct it in the right direction. Might give you a few clues to. Uh, uh, to how it's going to go. You know, one uh, uh, one example that I want to bring up, we, we just, uh, at, at the Smithsonian in a closed area, uh, we had a, a, a similar uh, uh, holly hedge that had grown sort of out of, uh, American holly hedge that had grown out of control uh, in terms of height. It was very difficult to maintain, um, but uh, uh, reducing it in height, the only, uh, if we, we knew if we did that, uh, we, uh, uh, it would just look really, really bad if we, uh, um, if we did it at the wrong time and in the wrong way. So we, we waited until this, this space was closed. We took a whole bunch off of the top of the hedge. Uh, and then all these latent buds that you're seeing, uh, you know, all this new light in here has, has caused these latent buds to break dormancy and grow in from beneath. Um, as those grow in, if we clip some of these, uh, uh, clip some of those tips off, uh, and, and allow that that hedge to uh, fill in more quickly. We may actually create a pretty nice looking hedge by the time that that space reopens. Um, so uh, uh, again, growth takes Thank time, you. but uh, um, really focusing on what objectives you're trying to achieve and and what plant you're working with. Uh, and and I agree with you. It looks like construction was was pretty rough on these. It's going to take it's going to take several years of of focus on pruning to uh, to bring them back to 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 what you want. Uh, but uh, uh, especially, it looks like both of them with time, uh, we probably achieve those objectives for you. So I, I will you. move forward to, it looks like we've got about five minutes left in the hour. So I'll move forward to at least uh, this, this last one and then we'll check in with Patricia and see, see if we, uh, uh, what, what our next steps are uh, after that. So uh, uh, next uh, case study here is Kathleen's Beach Plum. Uh, Kathleen, are, are you on and able to share anything? Now, I think I, I, let's see. 
I am here and uh, I bought this, but I'd like to have something a, a bit more tree shaped, I think, because I don't have much room. If you are not here. All right, so so what I'm hearing is, is we have this kind of um, uh, small um, sort of shrub like plum tree um, that that you per purchased um, for a very for a very small space um, and you're really curious how to kind of manage it in the small space or curious maybe if you have the right tree for the right space um no i'm i do have the right tree i think the problem is trying to shape it because it's got so many branches going to the side mm -hmm. and um I'm thinking, well, I would like to have beech plums, and I've seen them growing wild in all sorts of shapes because they adapt. You know, if they don't, if they have too much growing around them, they grow tall. Uh, and if they have the space, they tend to spread and sucker. It's now it has a huge root ball and a grow bag. Um, but I'm looking at this and thinking, well, I don't want to grow too much, but it has one branch going off that's quite strong. And I'm wondering, should I? prune out all the side ones. And then I also want to graft another beech plum onto this one because they need a uh, another plant to, uh, uh, you know, another beech plum in order to cross pollinate. So I haven't really done a lot of grafting before, but I thought, well, is that promising? Could I get another beech plum, plum graft some branches onto this one and end up with a, a double tree so that I'd actually have a native plant that produces fruit. I like to grow natives. All right, and so so if we if you could put your um, purpose into say like you know two or three different you know what are you trying to accomplish with this plant in this space? It sounds like like getting fruit out of it. Uh, it sounds like kind of creating a a small na native plant. Uh, you know what 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 are we hoping to accomplish with this tree? Uh, we're planning to have something, I mean, it will bloom in the spring and be pretty if I do nothing to it. So, I mean, that that's built into them and they're very durable as long as they're not plants that stay soggy. Um, my, my main thing is I'd like to have a tree that does produce some fruit and kind of is a little, uh, like a little specimen of a sturdy plant that will produce fruit you don't eat it out of hand. You have to make jam or pie out of it or something. But, you know, that natives can be edible, I guess, and can be give you joy because the pretty blossoms and, and uh, but as I got it, it's very sturdy, has a great root ball and all that, but it is so squat and very round. All right, so I'll, I'll kind of work in a couple minutes we have left. I'll, I'll work through these these steps one more time, and we'll see where we get to. But so uh, you know, step one, know our tree, and it sounds like you know know this tree really really well. But it's a uh, native tree that I, I would assume probably likes uh, you know pretty pretty well well drained soils. It's a it's a very small tree, so it's not gonna it's not gonna really really aggressively fill up the space. Though it sounds like there's some concerns about size. Um, and then one thing uh, that's really important, especially to think about on fruit trees um, is uh, again, what year wood are they fruiting on? So with many fruit trees, they're, they're fruiting on second year wood. Um, if, we, if we have this tiny little tree in, in the yard and we just cut back all the new growth every year to, to fit it into the space, um, then we may never get much fruit out of it. So uh, uh, just by knowing you know, some of those sort of basic facts, we may, may have a few ideas about how to uh, um, uh, prune this tree. Uh, I'll skip down to step three and four here is, um, you know, we don't know, I don't think we know a whole lot about the tree's uh, health or, or sight yet, since it sounds like it's, uh, like it's in a grow bag, but we'll assume that the, the tree's in pretty good health and that its sight is, is uh, a sight that makes it happy um, overall. Uh, again, I think you define sort of several purposes there. And again, usually we have more than one purpose for a tree. We want a beautiful native uh, native tree or small uh, small native tree or shrub. Uh, we want to get some fruit out of it, so that kind of goes to your your grafting uh, um, uh, plan there. And then and we want it just a nice native that fits into a um, to a small space. And so um, uh, I think uh, you know as far as several strategies to um, uh, to prune that, I think 
a few things I can think of. I think you mentioned it here is, is with the, uh, um, it tends to sucker quite a bit. You know, a lot of these water sprouts off the lower branches and things like that, like a lot of fruit trees do. So um, you can prune a lot of those out just to keep the tree looking nice. Um, and then uh, as you try to fit it into the space, you know, you can use some of the things we talked about earlier, like directional pruning to direct that growth to uh, where you have space and away from, you know, those, those uh, conflicts with your space, whether that's a, you know, fence or a side of the house, we can direct it to where we want that tree to grow, looking at where those, those secondary branches or, or secondary buds are pointed. Um, uh, you know, and, and certainly we can do some sort of small, because it's a small tree, it shouldn't grow too aggressively out of control. But if, if you need to, you can use some hand pruning or, or some small scale pruning to kind of pull it back in a little bit where it grows uh, uh, too far out of its space. But, but again, if we're, we're looking to get fruit out of it, we also have to know our tree and, and understand uh, uh, which years of growth we're going to get fruit out of and make sure we don't cut off all that new growth every year and, and remove its ability. Uh, to fruit. So again, hopefully that shows that by really being clear about what our purposes are uh, and thinking of a few pruning strategies, taking, taking a nice long uh, break and, and uh, leaning, uh, uh, leaning there on a garden tool while, while looking at the tree gives you a few, few ideas to really achieve what you're trying to accomplish uh, with that tree. So um, Great. Thank, thank you so much, Doug. It's seven o'clock now, so I think it's time to, to wrap up. I Unfortunately, I don't think we have time to get to any of the questions. There were a few in the chat box, but we ran out of time, which just shows how interesting your presentation was and how, how great this topic is. Um, any any last words, Jake? I just wanted to thank you all for, uh, for having me and especially thank the participants for, uh, uh, for offering up some of these sort of pruning dilemmas. Um, if we didn't, have, uh, since we didn't get a chance to uh, get to any of the questions, you know, if you have any really burning questions that I raised with this, uh, um, with this presentation, I will go to my last slide here. Um, and uh, please feel free to, to shoot me an email and uh, I'll try to answer any, any really, uh, uh, you know, questions that, uh, um, uh, that really piqued your interest that uh, that we didn't get to here during the presentation. So again, thanks for the opportunity to to uh, um, uh, to do this this evening. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Patricia. Great. Well, thank you so much. That's really nice of you, Jake. I'll share your email with everybody um, with the presentation. Uh, have a great night, everyone. Thanks so much for joining, and I will see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.